Good morning. Hello. And welcome to MIPCOM. I'm Laureen Garrod, Director of the TV Division at Reen Meetem. And welcome to the first Mastermind keynote. Today's first guest is award-winning, Emmy-nominated, multi-Michelin-starred chef, Gordon Ramsay. Yes. Gordon first came to Cannes in 1992 as chef on Reg Grundy's yacht, the Australian media mogul. Since then, he's become the world's most famous chef and TV personality. Today, Gordon Ramsay will look back on the last 25 years, his motivations, and how he maintains his brand across multiple platforms and across numerous restaurants around the world. Helping facilitate his remarks will be Cynthia Littleton, television editor for Variety. Please join me now in a huge round of applause to welcome Gordon Ramsay and moderator Cynthia Littleton. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. And Gordon, thank you for coming out. So happy to be back. You are the busiest man in television. I don't know how you've managed to uh, spare mm. us this half hour, but we are grateful. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. So everybody at this conference knows your bio and knows your trajectory over the last couple of years, last 10 years. But I thought we would just throw out some numbers that are incredibly impressive. Right. 2,000 hours of Gordon Ramsay programming a year. Shit, Just really? Drink, drink that in. Somewhere, at any moment in the world, somewhere, Gordon Ramsay is on TV yelling, investigating, fixing, that, probing. Something's going on with Gordon Ramsay. 2,000 hours a year. 2,000 hours of Gordon Ramsay, that, new and new right. library shows, but nonetheless. And across those 2,000 hours, how many fucks are in those? <laughs> or how many bleeps, I should Bleeps. I think, uh, yeah, we, we'll, we'll have to do a count. Eight shows on the Fox network, the U.S. Fox network alone. Yes. Eight shows that bring in $150 million a year in advertising. That's a good point for your next contract renegotiation. <laughs> Not to mention 31 restaurants. Yes. Seven Michelin stars. Yes. Books, merchandising of, of all types, very high quality. In fact, I bought a, I bought a wood... Um, I bought a wooden, um, uh, excuse me, I bought a wooden cutter. Uh, We're out of time. <laughs> Sorry. I, uh, I, I, I would have given it to you, trust me. I bought one strictly <laughs> I don't want you buying those things. Uh, let me send the stuff Strictly to you. because it was your brand. It's very kind, thank you. Cutting board, that was the right. word that was eluding me. And even video games. So I would have sent that to you. You made me feel bad now. I tell you what, it's though. good quality, though. I've, I've uh, had it for years. I'm going to be on the phone to Rupert straight after this. 150 million yes. a year in advertising. Yes. Wow. Yes. Anyway, and as exciting, so, it's an amazing, it's an amazing career. And as we, as we just heard, you first came here to Cannes and first to MIPCOM and your first visit to Cannes in 1992 as a chef yes. on the yacht of Reg Grundy, a legendary producer, who I'm, I'm amazing man. Um, First of all, it was um, a time in my life uh, under immense pressure from that Michelin star world that I needed a break. So it was almost like a sabbatical. And um, we were based on the Quasette, um, and it was uh, this beautiful yacht. And I, I had no idea who this man was. Um, so it was just exciting to be in that position, cooking for him and Joy. And um, he said, Gordon, we have a big dinner coming up. And there's a, a, a conference at MIP. I had no idea what that was. He said, please uh, give us your best and, and don't fuck this dinner up. So um, I made this incredible dinner, uh, incredible canapes. Um, I was 25, uh, spotty chef and anemic looking, and they kept me on the boat. I, didn't even, I wasn't even allowed over here. <laughs> I went off in the morning, a tender, got all the ingredients, came back and just made this incredible um, dinner. And then the time I spent with him then, uh, listening to his thoughts, understanding his passion, and then it all started to make sense just, you know, what this guy stood for and how much respect he had for his team and how long the team were with him. Um, I just had the most amazing 12 months on that boat because I, um, I got super fit, um, I earned a decent salary, and I, I, got, I got time to myself. Um, and then we stayed in touch. 
Mm -hmm. He came to our wedding in Chelsea. Uh, he said, I'm going to come for the most important part, the part of the church. Um, <laughs> and then he was sending the kids presents every year. So, yeah, an amazing man. I would never have thought 25 years ago that I'd be back here, you know, 2017 um, at this incredible conference. Oh, my God. Do you remember at that time what your ambition was? I mean, did you have, you had Michelin stars, but was your ambition to grow in television? Or was that something that developed as you got to know Reg? No, he, he mentioned briefly, do you ever see yourself on TV? I said, there's no way on earth that I'm fit for TV. Um, secondly, I think when you're on that ambitious road and had the training from, from, from Marco to Gavroche to Guy Savoie to Robochon, I spent some time at Ducasse uh, here, um, I wanted to strive for three stars. Because three stars, Michelin was almost like a sort of an Oscar. Uh, that's what it meant. It had that kind of kudos. So um, I wanted no distractions. And I think the foundations had to be set, having been selfishly in those kitchens and absorbing you know, from the very best. Because I came to France to become French and, and, and literally understand that level of haute cuisine and master my craft, I think. And that plays reverent today in terms of whether it's a, um, a challenge in you know, culinary genius, or whether it's a MasterChef junior challenge, we need to put it to its absolute best and make sure. I always know when it's a success when we get copied, and that, that, that confirms that we're on, we're on point. By other TV shows, but, uh, borrow your format. Yeah, in terms of that, I think it's lazy to copy, but when I see others copying us and, and the team and what they do, um, that keeps you on your toes. So you move it before it gets stale. How, as you did get into television, of course, first in the UK, was it hard for you to learn how to be on TV, how to work with the camera, how to, how to be a TV personality? Have Is you ever a... seen Kitchen Nightmares, Cynthia? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, Kitchen Nightmares was um, a, um, it, was, it, it was almost me being let off the leash. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, yeah, of course, we were filming it, but there was no, there was no stop start do this, do that. It was literally get inside that business, turn that business around, give it a big shake, um, and then piece it back together. They hate you for the first three or four days, then they sort of are inquisitive about you, and then the last three or four days, they, they fall in love with you. Um, and it was an amazing sort of insight to the problems in our industry, because unlike a doctor's surgery where you need to study medicine for 10 years or uh, go to bar school to become a lawyer, anybody can buy a restaurant. Um, and I want to get back to that dinner party where, you know, Marjorie and Philip are sat having dinner and the neighbours say, food's fucking amazing, you should open a restaurant. And they fall in love with the idea as opposed to the passion of what it takes on a daily basis. Restaurants are business uh, and it's, it's tough businesses. So um, you need to be passionate on a daily basis, not just when you feel like it. So Kitchen Nightmares was the sort of first big insight to, I suppose, refixing and, and repositioning um, businesses. We, we flew in yesterday from New Orleans um, and we have a, an amazing new uh, show called 24 Hours to Helen Back and it is businesses that have literally got 24 hours. We have a surveillance team in there undercover for the first three weeks before I get there and we're sort of monitoring all the bad habits and then I go in undercover and I was a jazz musician and I had a beard and fedora and, uh, and I'm sat sort of eating quickly and then I go to the bathroom and change to come out. <laughs> I, I was shocked at what you gather over three weeks when staff don't realize they're being filmed. But more importantly, there were more rats in the kitchen than there were in customers. And I know Bourbon Ooh. Street is laden with that, but um, I was asking the uh, lady for some toast um, because the po' boy and the Cajun chicken was terrible. So we just had some toast. All the band members had toast. Um, lo and behold, 15 minutes later, and I, I go to the toaster, I look inside, and there's this dead fucking mouse inside my toaster. It must have been sat there since sort of 2004. Long tail, crispy. Uh, <laughs> hold on, you, you didn't have to eat the toast. Anyway, so I, I, I showed the waitress this, and she said, well, we, we, we don't use that side of the toaster. <laughs> it's like, right, so you don't use that side of the toaster, but it's happy. You're happy to send that shit uh, to me. So um, that, that, that's the issue. Yeah. Uh, businesses get lazy and I think like a, a, a viewer, you know, customers vote with their feet, uh, like a viewer votes with their control and sure. so if it's not good enough, uh, they're going to switch or walk. Do you think that being a businessman, being such a successful businessman has 
in, in the restaurant business allowed you to prosper in TV in a way that you went into it with a CEO's sort of mentality as opposed to talent that was just, you know, dying to get their first break on camera? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, we, we have an amazing team, by the way, you know, behind me. So um, I, you know, I'm, I multitask. Um, and so I think, you know, you could be the best chef in the world, but if you've got a, a bad business behind that, then you look, you know, the most stupid. So um, Stuart Gillies is our CEO and he runs that business side. Um, as a chairman, I just try to um, influence them as many ways as possible, my way of thinking, without being too, you know, uh, assertive in the way that it should be done my way. So when we have meetings, um, there's no long-winded board meetings, it's just um, three or four times a week, give me the key issues that piss you off when you come to work every morning. And what comes out of that uh, is, is, is pivotal. And I think that's the, that's the solution you know, making, and I think that's very similar. And there's so many synergies between running a business um, as a restaurant there is to TV, because you have to stay fresh. You have to be uh, the next best thing, and you have to be raising the bar. So this year we just celebrated 18 years at Royal Ossel Road with three Michelin stars, and we got asked the question on the day of the launch of the Michelin Guide, if you're such a hands-on chef, who does the cooking when you're there? Well, it's the same people when I'm not there. We have that kind of synergy. It's the exact same in TV. Uh, MasterChef, you know, a culinary challenge, um, um, elimination. You know, we move the goalposts, uh, and we, we the we, F word is a is a fun. Yeah, F word was live, so that's that was a tough one to break in. You know, that's uh, that was a moving target, and there's so many moving, exciting things that every chef in the country worth their salt should be cooking live. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it was it was a great insight to see how much fun you can have live. Um, and um, it was it was an amazing uh, an amazing summer. And you enjoyed it. Would, you'll do I, it again. I, I did. You know, I, I, I can. You know, I can cook. I promise you. <laughs> I, can, I can stop what I'm doing now and get in the kitchen and cook. So yeah, I loved it. Yeah, I mean, I really do enjoy that level of vulnerability. And I think never shying away from that. And the more success you have, the more wrapped up in cotton wool you get. And so I'm the opposite. You know, I. I I, I, I need to be at that cold face. I need to be, you know, where the heartbeat is, and I need to be in that level of uh, trepidation. And I also need to be under pressure. I think pressure's healthy. You know, a couple of months back, we were landed into the middle of a jungle in Colombia ahead of a documentary uh, on cocaine right. this week. And you know, Major said to me, "Look, we don't. We can do the shots from above. We can we can shoot this thing, you know, above, and we're going to torch that lab, and we're going to spray that crop and." I said, no, fuck that. I want to go in the jungle. Uh, I want to go down on that patch and understand how big this problem is. So You're talking about Gordon Ramsay on cocaine. Yes. Your documentary. I, I don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> it's a provocative title. It get, grabs people's attention in the television listings guide. Yes. But it is a very serious, um, it is a very serious look at, at you know, the soup to nuts issue mm. of you go look from the very beginnings of the supply chain in Colombia through the devastation yes. of what cocaine addiction, you make the point that what cocaine addiction um, you know, takes out of people, particularly in, in the cooking business, I think you make a very interesting point in the documentary that it is still, cocaine is sort of seen as a very recreational, it's fun, it's not, it's not the sort of degradation of heroin, but you no. make the case that it is a incredibly debilitating addiction and it's rampant in the food business. Yeah, it's everywhere. I mean, I, it, it bugs the hell out of me when chefs have this sort of, you know, rock and roll image. Uh, it, you know, the sexy, chefs, you know. Uh, it's all bullshit. You know, chefs are like sportsmen today. They, they, they prep for hours and hours for that three minute of magic across that entree or, or appetizer. But the issue in our business is, is, is shocking. Uh, we're responsible for 30 tons of it coming in uh, every year. And that's not just in, in, our, in our business. But I also personally lost an amazing young chef Mm -hmm. We had dinner the night before he died, so if you'd asked me, did I know? I should have known, because I have a brother who's an addict, so it's close on a daily basis. And so offering that branch, you know, highly confidential, behind the scenes to members of staff that may have a habit, customers giving side plates back to my waiting staff, because they've just been in the bathroom and, 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 and done several lines, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of crap for, for servers to take. They shouldn't be up against that. I was a little bit shocked when I tested the bathrooms um, and they came up positive uh, throughout. 
And so there was a like the problem. countertops, or yeah, yeah, and not just the the, the customer toilets, the staff mm -hmm. toilets. So you know, who knows? So it's a very fine line because we can't throw the team under the bus. So it's look, you know, I'm there to help. I don't want any more casualties. Um, you earn incredibly well. It's not recreational, and you know it. it the demands get stronger. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we went to we we went off the beaten track in some some pretty horrific places. So uh, I didn't tell Fox I was going. <laughs> They'll find out on Thursday. <laughs> so I uh, yeah again I, that passionate project for me was like the shark documentary uh, or the bad boy bakery sat in a prison um, behind bars when these guys are sat on their ass for eighteen hours and they come back into society with no further qualifications and they reoffend within 90 days of being out. So giving them that kind of certificate to hold on to. Skill, to, a, a marketable skill. skill. Uh, exactly. Um, going into prison at Brixton and watching a, 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 a five course menu, they had a choice for dinner. <laughs> going to the gym, you know, going to the, see the doctor, playing five side football every day, nominating their programs, their films, what they're gonna watch. This prison was like a fucking hotel. So they were coming out worse than before they went in. So it was given that stimulant to go back in society with um, more confidence, you know, mm -hmm. and a skill to stand alone. Mm -hmm. Who was, for, I mean, you're doing such a range of production. Who would you say were your mentors as, as a producer? Because you are a very hands-on producer now. Yeah, hands-on producer, but not scared of being produced um, and taking that advice. That's a rare quality, I think. Yeah, and, and also, I, you know, when I, when, I, when I fuck up, I want to be told. Um, but, you know, Pat Llewellyn was an amazing influence growing up. You know, from the Two Fat Ladies to the Naked Chef to Kitchen Nightmares. She was legendary. All three have given me the platform without the straitjacket in a way to incubate, develop, and, and, and create some incredible ideas. So from a producer's point of view, I, I, I just get creative because I, I, I put the team to the test. Is that the best? You know, are we at that cutting edge? Is it something that Top Chef's going to copy? Uh, you know, is it, is it MasterChef of the UK? Are, are they going to copy our ideas? What are we going to learn from that? And, you know, how real can we make it? And then also, I think, taking off that jacket and getting in the trenches and doing it with them, I think is really important. So it's almost like a, a conductor that can play and orchestrate at the same time. So that multitasking insight to producing amazing drama, uh, you need to be in the thick of it. But I'll go back to, you know, 25 years ago, you know, I, I, I still work at mastering my craft behind the scenes, i.e., you know, in the kitchen, you know, coming up with the latest idea. If a new restaurant opens up in Barcelona or on the outskirts uh, of Chicago, our team are there. And there's something to learn from a bad experience as much as there is from a good experience. Mm. So mm -hmm. um, that whole social media platform now has kept every business, you know, globally on their toes because there's no six week lead in for a critic. You get the feedback, you know, seconds later and that's healthy. And I mean, you know, the, the blessing and the curse of celebrity is if somebody goes and has a bad experience in your restaurant and they start talking about Gordon Ramsay, that has a lot, you know, that has more resonance in social media and on the reviews. I mean, that's got to be something that is, you talk about keeping you on your toes. Yeah. Your reputation yeah. is. Yeah, and unfortunately, you, you start getting judged by individuals who know less about food than you do. And so everybody's a critic. So you just, you, you get thick skinned mm -hmm. um, and you, you learn to take those blows. Um, is it significant damaging to the business? If you're doing it wrong, yes, it is. If you're not, then you have to accept that and just move on. So, you know, it's important to stay on top and not ignore uh, those issues. If they're fundamental and it's consistent with six or seven customers saying the same thing or six and seven viewers complaining about the same issue uh, on that program, then you move quickly, uh, really quickly. Um, and that's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, in, in, in terms of your producing, you've recently done a very big venture with All Three Media to launch Studio Ramsey. Yes. As, and as I understand that, that is really there is there is a limit to the in space and time to how many how much you can do on camera. But in this in this deal, you really envision doing a lot of producing of shows that you will produce, but maybe not appear in. Yeah, I think the, the, the important part is to pull back from fronting it and get creative with that experience over the last uh, three decades that I've had and some of the talented producers I've worked with. Uh, Chris Brogdon is he heading the uh, company. He amazing background at Sky and 
uh, Tenopolis, and so he, he, he knows his stuff. So for me, um, again, I want to get involved with that kind of uh, jeopardy. What can I bring to the table? Um, and how new are we? How cutting edge are we? How, how cool is that idea? And will it travel? So um, incubating those ideas and setting up workshops, even in our business, without the team realizing they're being filmed at the same time, you know, we're looking for characters, we're spotting new ideas, and then um, just just tweaking those little pressure points and seeing what happens. Um, so that level of creativity for me is crucial. That's the way I am. That's, that's me naturally. So, you know, I am the biggest pain in the ass in the world when it comes to that level of development because I want the very best and I'll push, I'll push the boundaries because I push myself to the boundaries. So I think that's a healthy relationship because it's not about an ego. It's about are we the best because we need to be. If we're not, then don't bring it to the table. Um, it, it, it's, it's really important to nail it. Mm -hmm. In terms of your experience in, in kitchens and in that, in that pressure cooker of, of delivering a great experience to the guest, would you say that the TV Gordon Ramsay tones it down from what the real life is like in a kitchen, or is it? That's a really good question. I mean, let's be honest, flipping a burger and dressing a Caesar salad, you could do that shit tomorrow. <laughs> if you're gonna go and cook at the very best, and you get to the top with three Michelin stars, no disrespect, but you know, working for Joe Robuchon, Guy Savoie, Marco Pierre White, I had their reputations in my, in my hand. So if I fucked up, I'm gonna take the rap. And if there's a multi-million dollar production coming out of Fox and I fuck up, I'm gonna take the rap. So I, when I'm in the zone, you know, don't disturb me, you know, don't, don't poke me, because I'll be like an angry bear, let me do my, <laughs> let me do my work. And so that's how serious I take it, I think. So Mike goes on, it's nothing to do with the camera, I just need to do my work. They'll follow me and they'll pick up what they need to pick up. So I never change that attitude in a way that, do I honestly go home and sit and watch an edited version of Kitchen Nightmares after filming 85, 90 hours to watch a 44 minute uh, clip? No, not when you've lived that, been there, done that. Um, so, you know, I do, process things and I review them constantly, um, but I'm not one for stopping and looking behind. I'm always, I'm, I'm looking forward to what, what's, what, what, what's happening. Mm -hmm. You have another member of the family that yes. has followed in your footsteps. Matilda is yeah. now well into her show, Matilda and the Ramsey Bunch. What advice did you give her about being on camera? About being I told her not to date a fucking chef. <laughs> 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 if you come back, my daughter. <laughs> you come back and date a chef, I'm going to kick you out of the house. Um, here's the thing. I mean, for me, cooking at that age, they all grew up with it um, from the F words. Uh, and whilst families in London were buying kids iPads and Xboxes, you know, we bought them animals. Fuck it. You're going to know how a turkey gets bred and you know what a pig gets, you know, taught and you know how to look after sheep. So it was installing that don't waste things. And so... You know, the pressure of kids with exams today is way, way, way too severe about these charts and performing at school. And I think we all peak differently in life. There's different times. We don't all peak at 16 or 18 or 21. So getting them to cook early was really important because where they didn't have the academic, you know, qualifications, they had the confidence in cooking. So I really wish we'd have more of a, an imprint across the educational platform in order to make sure that this confidence comes out early. And teaching them to cook was crucial. Tilly's a natural. Uh, they all cook, um, but she just popped in, a, in, a, in a, an amazing way, and uh, she's got no idea how successful she is, and it's really important for her to understand that it's just work. And she's 15? She's 15, oh. yes, yeah. Uh, but, you know, Matilda Ramsey Bunch on CBBCs is, you know, a, an exciting insight to teenage life, cooking with no fear, um, and cooking having fun. So, um, yeah, she doesn't let me do too much. It's all about sort of, you know, what she puts. <laughs> it's that canvas, that blanket canvas of confidence that you can come out and just, you know, explode on that plate. Just have fun with it. Cooking with no fear. And we, we see that across MasterChef Junior in a way that first thing I say to them, look, there's no mum and dad, there's no teachers. You're going to love me, you're going to hate me, but you're going to leave a much better individual. And when we have a problem, I'm going to help you with a solution. And it's salvaging those last 15 minutes of that 60 minute cook off that, okay, we've screwed the New York strip and the burgers overcooked, but we've got 15 minutes to make something incredible here. Let's, and then at the end of that, that's life. You're gonna go up, you're gonna go down, understand that. So 
you know, working with eight-year-olds, nine-year-old, ten-year-olds, and watch them bounce back from adversity when they've got, you know, tears streaming through, coming out of them because they think they've lost this big opportunity that their parents wanted to go on Master Chef Junior. It's really important, really important. The kids are great. The pain of the ass are the parents. <laughs> that bloody green room. Okay, I can only imagine. Is it, I mean, is it, certainly your parenthood experience certainly has probably prepped you for MasterChef Junior, but is it hard to deliver a tough verdict when you have somebody who's visibly, sh you know, a 10-year-old who's... Um, this is a good question. Here's the thing, it's tough love, because it's being honest with them, and all I say to, to, to my kids, I started at the age of five, sat them down, look at me, the earlier you tell me, the more I can help. Mm -hmm. They look at me like I'm some weirdo, and all of a sudden they get it. 15 years of age, Megan, our eldest daughter, came up and said, Dad, I really understand what you said to me five years ago. The earlier you, you share it, the more I can do. And it's exactly with those young kids today. What's the solution? How do we get out of this? And let's turn that negative into something positive, and you're going to have some fun with it. So, you know, yes, it's hard. You know, not crushing their dreams, because to be success is not about just winning. So you don't, you're not a failure if you get into the top 10. And it's like giving them that kind of confidence that you got into the top 20, you know, top 15, top 10, top five, you are bloody good, remember that. And um, get hungry, find that passion in life. Because once that light bulb, you know, flickers and you find out that's what you want to do, that's your calling, it's an amazing journey. Yeah, that's good. We have just a few seconds left. With all the accomplishments over 25 years, yes. what is elusive to you? What are you still, what are you, st what are you still striving for? What, what achievement would you like to? have in hand when you come back in 25 years? Yeah, I think if I come back here in 25 years, time, I'll <laughs> Well, hopefully it won't be 25 years. I oh, know, no. I'd like to get the same size boat that Reg got. <laughs> uh, I, I think just keeping it fresh. Keeping it fresh and, and not getting stale because uh, it is so exciting, you know, with the team and the development and then um, coming up with that next cutting edge idea. That's, that, that's what keeps me awake at night. Great. Thank you so much for taking Thank the you. time out to speak with us, Gordon. You're we welcome. really appreciate Thank it. You. I'm sorry I had to pay for that board. I'm going to send you some boards. Don't. I'm, just, I'm telling you, it's a good cutting board. Yeah, I know, but I feel bad that you paid for it. For goodness sake. You know I get them for nothing. <laughs> Please.